Let me ask you a question. Let me give you a scenario without any context first. Suppose you have an eight-year-old and a six-year-old and there's one cookie to divide among the two people. Let's say that the father decides to give the eight-year-old a 60% portion of the cookie and 40% to the six-year-old. Is that fair? If you had a chance to think about this, the answer is actually there's no right answer. Like, you know, we have one category of people who thinks it's not fair because, you know, maybe like, you know, it should be 50-50. It seems like the dad is favoring the eight-year-old uh, to the six-year-old. And usually six-year-olds get more attention. But then, you know, if I add a bit of context to it, the situation changes. Maybe the eight-year-old carries more responsibilities around the house. Um, you know, maybe like uh, the six-year-old got punished for doing something silly, like, you know, I don't know, getting toilet paper wet and throwing it on top of the ceiling, like, you know, in school, like, you know, just kid stuff. Like, just things that, like, you know, if you add a bit of context, all of a sudden, it seems more fair and more logical, basically. My uh, taxation teacher gave me this example, like, and then uh, he, he mentioned something about how, like, in, when you're in this class, take all concepts of fairness and throw it right out the window, because fair is a subjective term. What one person defines as fair might not be what the other person thinks. Like, um, I'll, I'll use acting as an example again, even though I did it in my previous video. Um, you know, I used to always think that it was unfair that I was like, you know, not going to become an actor because, you know, I thought, man, I had the strongest potential. Ain't nobody got more passion than I do, you know, and like those people who are currently on stage, they can't do it nearly as good as I can. I even made out one of my own scripts, you know, <laughs> but like, you know. Then, you know, people will suddenly like uh, Taylor Swift. It seems like pe people like Taylor Swift, don't get me wrong, who I actually like quite a bit of her songs. Make no mistake, though, Taylor Swift and I are never, ever, ever getting back together. Anyways, Taylor Swift easily gets a career like, you know, in the blink of an eye. And the answer is because her dad actually brought her career for her. You know, it, like, and... You know, he he's very rich, so she and he has connections, so she's easily able to get into the um, entertainment industry. Now, to me, that seems unfair because it seems like I've had to work very hard for it while she didn't have to work for it all. But then maybe her dad, you know, just was a very successful entrepreneur. I, I haven't researched this um, disclaimer, but like, you know, maybe there's some background I don't know. You know, maybe her dad worked very hard for it. You know, maybe... Her dad was a successful millionaire and like doing just grinding and such where I, my family didn't, you know, like, you know, get to do that path. There's some unfairness to it. Maybe there's some elements of luck, you know, I've learned to accept it. I've learned from a long time ago, the only thing that makes life unfair is the preconceived notion that it should be fair. Yeah, it, it's this concept is not fair for everyone. Yeah, um, even to academics. Um, I'll make that in a next video. But for the longest time, I've actually struggled. I've actually had to struggle with um, with you know managing my homework. Like what would happen was it would take me ever since grade four. This is the scenario. It would take me until ten p.m. to like you know get my get my stuff done. Like, I don't know why, like, from grade four all the way up until now, even I struggle with it. Like, you know, that's why I'm barely making videos because, you know, I'm like, you know, doing courses. I'm I'm also looking for a job in the process, which I think kind of helps. But then it was like, people are wondering, what in the heck were you doing? Well, I, I did have some time management issues and I, I still do, you know, right now. And I always thought that, you know, it was unfair that, you know, I see like, you know, social media where some of my acquaintances are like riding, like, you know, going to Disneyland or like, you know, 
they have their every single minute of every single day. That's a bit of an exaggeration though, but they're like posting stuff like, you know, about fashion, about, you know, them, like, you know, uh, them tasting all sorts of food around the place. And I'm like, why can't that be me? And like, eat, I, I've tried many times and it, it, it just couldn't like, you know, I, I've tried to emulate it. Like, you know, I was like, there's a semester in college where I only took two courses and they were both fairly easy courses. And I just still couldn't bring myself to do it. Like, you know, I was like, I, I ended up resorting to slack, slacking off and, you know, just like, you know, playing on my computer and like, um, just that. I thought it was unfair that others had more opportunities than me. But when you add more context to it, maybe I just had a, maybe I just didn't find the right way to pay attention to my academics, or maybe I'm just not cut out for that entrepreneurship type of entertainment where I go to with, I go daily with friends at restaurants and, you know, all sorts of that stuff. I, even if I tried, even if my life depended on it, depended on it, I could not do it. And like, you know, it's in a mix of style, you know, work habits and so on. So yeah, like I I remember, um, I remember back when I was in uh, my um, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, sort of club that um, there was this girl named Alex and um, she rarely smiled, you know, like she was the exact opposite to, you know, what you see in some wait waiters and waitresses and restaurants who, you know, they're, they're always smiling and giving you a cheerful face and all that sort of like, um, and then like, you know, I, I remember toward the last, last, um, session of Dungeons and Dragons that semester, I said to her, hey, you know, maybe you should try, you could try smiling a bit. She's like, I don't really like smiling. And then I said, like, just try it. And then she said, she waited a bit. And then she said, okay. And then she sounded a bit uncomfortable about it. And I remember my coordinator told me, no, Brent, we got, we have to be careful about giving people advice, especially if it's unsolicited. And at first I was like, what's so bad about smiling? But the more I think about it, like, you know, the more right he is because you know, forcing Alex to smile, especially if her heart's not in it. Like, if you force someone to do something when their heart's not in it, like, um, this isn't a, this doesn't apply to all scenarios, but, like, I think it applies to this scenario of smiling. Like, it could come across really awkward and creepy. Like, you know, that she she forced smiles. Like, is like, oh, uh, hello, hello, and like, if she, then she's not being herself, and people can come. A, come across that and see it as fake or not genuine and might like her even less basically um yeah so you know that's the thing like i wanted to talk about like um going back to i think i went a bit on a tangent there um no i was talking about academics you know like how one thing that fits one person isn't right for another and this also transitions like what, about the fairness, about the sense of entitlement. You know, it's like ju just because you are something like you feel like you should get that thing. And that's just that that's not right. You know, like um, just because I have a passion to be in the entertainment industry, I should get it. Like, no, God, God blessed me with the gifts that he did. You know, um, the last thing I wanted to talk about, I can relate to this was um the nice guy syndrome you, the a nice guy for those of you who don't know nice guy syndrome basically are replies to those nice guys who feel that who feel a sense of resentment and anger because they feel that just because they are nice to girls they should be able to get a girlfriend but see that's the, where the sense of unfairness and entitlement applies again because it's like shocker nice guys you're actually not nice because if you were nice you would allow the girls to freely make a decision a choice into who they want to date i remember there was this uh show in uh, life lessons with Luis where like you know there's nice guy brian like um uh was a with a Muslim girl and he he wanted to date her, but she made it very clear that they only wanted to be friends. And he felt that because of the way he treated her, 
they, they should be boyfriend and girlfriend that that's not that's like you know nice guy syndrome he's not being nice you know, he feels just because you know they like you know he treats her well that he should get what he wants well that's <laughs> that actually contradicts like you know what you you nice guys are trying to achieve so it's like you're not doing these nice things out of the kindness of your heart you're only doing it for a eternal benefit for something of return you know it's like <laughs> It's like, I've seen homeless guys who have more compassion than that. I remember a particular homeless guy who was willing to share his pizza with a businessman because that businessman was hungry. And like, you know, the homeless guy didn't want him to starve. He's like, I may not have much, but I, I'm always happy to share. Like that touched my heart so much, even when he's struggling himself. That the nicest thing is you can be nice to others, but don't expect anything in return. You know, the right girl will come. Same thing with academics. It doesn't matter. You know, maybe it just so happens that someone only has to work half the time you have to and still get an A. That's out of your control. You know, what you can do is focus on yourself. Just focus on, well, you know, I'm going to I worked the best of my abilities. I work, I used 100% effort every second of the day. Well, maybe not every second of every day, but I focused on the subject as much as I could. And I got an A. I couldn't do it in half the time, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to force myself to these social norms, and I'm not going to have a sense of entitlement. As opposed to the guys trying to be nice. You know, you tried your best with a girl, you know, she maybe had a few options, but decided one person who also treated her nicely was just the better fit. You know, what you can do is just continue being who you are and not try to um, conform to the social norm and one girl will eventually come to reach you. That is what I have to say about the um, efforts being in the right place. It's related to entitlement. Now, one more thing I wanted to one more branch I wanted to talk about um, these uh, efforts is, you know, about your goals. Your goals should be, are you doing the right goals? Are your goals should be oriented in the proper way? Like, first of all, first of all, don't make finite goals. Finite goals are good when you achieve them, but afterwards you lose your motivation. If your only goal is to say, oh, you know, my goals are um, to get get a girlfriend, get a house, you know, um, to stop my drug addiction, if you are doing drugs, like, that's not, those are good goals, but they're not nearly as great. And let me tell you why. The second you reach all three of these goals, you're going to be like, I, I'm only 23 right now, so I'll apply to myself. The second I reach all three of these goals, I'll, I'll like, the worst case scenario is I'll be 29 years old. Assuming that the average person lives up to 80 years old, that still leaves 51 years with no room for growth and no room for development then I'm going to, uh, the second I reach these goals, I'm going to revert back to my old self, to that unmotivated, lazy slob that I am. And if things escalate badly enough, I could lose my job. I could lose my discipline. I could re revert back to drug addictions. I, I don't like, um, I don't like have drug addictions, but I smoke once in a while. And like, um, I, I'll lose my girl, you know, Instead, make sort of goals that help you grow and that, that you can do them like, you know, daily or weekly and increment on something new. Like, you know, for example, my goal, like, you know, hopefully in 10 years from now, um, I will be a master at chess. And after I reach that 10 year mark, I plan to learn one new thing about chess every week. Uh, right now, it's a little, like, time-constricted, so I'm doing, like, one new thing in chess every two weeks, and I, I'm i trying to make one vi YouTube video every two weeks, and when I get a job, like, you know, maybe a nine-to-five, I'll, like, you know, probably try to do it once every two or three days, and hopefully by then, 
I will be able to maintain a consistent time base. And afterwards, I will spend my time learning how to edit better and better. So it's like, you see how that YouTube goal, I could apply to every single week of my life. And like, you know, even once I graduate and even once I learn how to edit, it's not the end for me. I, I always think of new interesting topics that I hope could benefit myself and benefit others. I would watch these videos 10 years from now and to, you know, help myself learn. And for those, like, for those of you who are saying, you know, like, I don't have the time, you know, to reach my goals, like, you know, I like for those Christians out there, I don't have time to read the Bible or the chess masters like Magnus Carlsen. I don't have the time to learn chess. Let me tell you something. Anything you're committed to doing, you will find the time to do it. And I can speak from this from a personal level. Like, I told myself I would do two hours of chess a day, no matter what. And 95% of the time, that, um, that goal has been achieved. Like, ever since September 22nd, no, September 27th, Tuesday of last year, that goal has been achieved. And I have not relapsed very much at all. Like two hours a day of chess, like basically, you know, um, that, uh, that has, yeah. And like, see, despite how many courses I was taking, and even right now, despite how busy I am, I still made time for it. And like, you know, even though I'm busy, I also find time to read the Bible. Like, because I told myself, I want to be closer to God. I have that burning desire for it. And you might ask, well, Brent, you know, if you're struggling with time management and if you're so busy, how do you even take the time to learn the Bible? Well, aside from passion, I, I squeeze in the minimal amount of time, even if it's just a page a day to do it. Like, I do it on the bus rides to work and back. And I do it, I read some pages of the Bible before going to bed every night. See, I was so committed to reading the Bible that I devoted time to it. And it's not going to be a limited goal of understanding the Bible in its full because it's very complex. So that is all I have to say for this video. Don't be entitled and have the right goals. I love to stay, but for now, I got to jump. I'll see you guys on the other side of the bridge. Catch you next time.